Hello, human geographers. We are back at it again this evening. Tonight, we're going to examine different types of policies that impact demographics. We will begin with anti-natalist policies, which are policies that encourage couples to limit the number of children they have. These policies, sometimes called restrictive policies, are designed to bring down total fertility rates, limit population growth, reduce the strain on natural resources, and attempt to balance out high youth dependency ratios. So let's dive straight into some examples. The Central African country of Rwanda has seen some results by promoting antinatalism in the form of family planning. The use of family planning increased from less than 5% in the year 2000 to over 50% in 2010. As a result, the total fertility rate in Rwanda is around 4 babies per woman, down from over 8 babies per woman in 1979. Nigeria began an antinatalist program in 1998 to encourage women to use contraception and provided free family planning education. Egypt began the Two is Enough campaign in 2018, when the total fertility rate was over three babies per woman. The country used a media campaign to encourage families to stop at two children. They also provided greater maternal and child health care, along with cash support to persuade families to have fewer kids. But perhaps one of the most prominent examples of antinatalism is the sterilization campaigns used in India. From 1975 to 1977, men were sterilized to try and limit population growth. Many of these men were poor and were sterilized without their consent. Others were bribed or coerced into sterilization. And while health care, nutrition, and education for girls was also part of the Indian antinatalist policy, the sterilizations proceeded while many of the other aspects were ignored. But perhaps the most well-known and certainly the most asked about policy on the AP exam is the one couple, one child mandate in China, commonly referred to as the one child policy. This policy was in effect from 1980 to 2015. So let's understand the social, economic, and political history that led up to the one-child policy. The teachings of Confucius in China valued large, multi-generational families that lived together. Combine those cultural values with the economic benefit of having many children that could help in an agricultural community, the total fertility rate in China in 1949 was over six babies per woman. But rapid population growth led the Chinese government in the 1970s to push antinatalism. Media campaigns advocating later marriage, longer times between pregnancies, and fewer babies overall attempted to curb the high total fertility rate. But by 1980, the government in China implemented arguably the strictest anti-NATO's policy ever implemented. The government provided free contraceptives and prenatal care, paid maternity leave, and cash rewards for following the policy. Those who didn't, however, faced fines, were unable to get housing or schooling, and if the parents held a government position, the possibility of demotion if they didn't adhere. But it worked at reducing the fertility rate. The total fertility rate in China dropped from 5.4 babies per woman to 1.8. Now let's look at some of the consequences of this policy. Nearly 100 million people have no sibling, which means the financial and emotional burden of caring for parents and grandparents falls solely on their shoulders. There is a huge imbalance in the sex ratio. As male babies were desired, many female babies were aborted or abandoned. So there are 30 to 40 million 
more young men than women in China. And many of the single men are unable to find a wife. And many who can't find a wife are from the lower social and economic classes, which has led to concerns about antisocial behavior and crime, particularly against women. And from an economic standpoint, China is facing a projected shortage of working age people who can support their rising elderly population. This is especially concerning as China does not have a national welfare program for their elderly. So this might lead to rising cost of living for the elderly in China. Shifting gears to the other type of population policy, we are now going to look at pro-natalist policies, which are policies that provide incentives for women to have children, typically in countries where population is declining. These policies are sometimes called expansive policies because they're trying to expand the population. These policies are intended to boost fertility rates thereby accelerating population growth, which is why we tend to see them in countries that are experiencing natural decrease or a negative NIR, like many European countries. So let's again look at some examples. Sweden provides more than a year of parental leave while still receiving 80% of their salaries. And parents can use it any time up to their child's eighth birthday and it accumulates for each child that is born. Families in Sweden also receive a monthly allowance from the government, equivalent to more than 100 US dollars per child. In France, parents receive tax breaks, generous parental leave, childcare services, and a family allowance. There's also a family discount on trains and in other daily expenses. Russia, has increased childcare benefits and the length of maternity leave. And in 2007, one Russian province declared September 12th the National Day of Conception, and parents got the day off of work to uh, help increase the birth rate. The local government even gave couples prizes who gave birth nine months later. As a result, the birth rate on July 12th, 2008, was nearly four times the daily average. Russia has also provided payments of nearly 10,000 US dollars for a second or third child. In Hungary, women who have four or more children are exempt from paying income tax. And the government has reduced mortgage and car payments Provided, provided parental leave for grandparents and increased daycare options. They have also offered scholarships to university students who promise not to move away. An example that these pronatalist policies could be geared towards preventing emigration as well. But it isn't just European countries that have instituted pronatalist policies. In 2018, the government of Tanzania in Sub-Saharan Africa encouraged its female citizens to stop taking birth control in an attempt to increase its population. One of the most interesting case studies of population policies is Singapore. Singapore is a small island state in Southeast Asia. In the 1960s, economic growth led to a population boom. So the government of Singapore instituted anti-natalist policies, making contraceptives available at low cost, creating family planning clinics, and a media campaign promoting smaller families. But in the 1980s, it became clear that the anti-natalist policies were too effective. There were concerns about labor force shortages, a high elderly dependency ratio, and increasing costs of retirement and health care for the elderly. So the government shifted to a pro-natalist approach. 
The government tried to encourage larger families, offering baby bonuses, financial benefits to female university graduates with more than three children, and paternity leave for fathers. They also launched a media campaign to encourage couples to participate in National Night in an attempt to raise fertility rates. But Singapore's fertility rate remains low and declining. The total fertility rate dropped from 1.25 babies per woman in 2015 to 1.1 in 2019. And we're going to discuss the implications of both pronatalist and antinatalist policies when we come back to class. Have a good evening, everyone.